Wake up, Sleeping Beauty! Today we're going to be taking a look at your lead animator. He's versatile, creative, and he was an amazing draftsman. Who could bring such talent to our favorite drowsy princess? Let's find out. Before we start, don't forget to check out our Patreon, our Discord, and of course, like and subscribe. Okay, let's get right into it. There have already been two episodes made about Mark Davis's life, and since you're a halfway decent person, I know you've watched both of them. But just in case you need a refresher, go watch them right now. Or don't. Do whatever you want, I don't care, I get paid anyway, let's move on. For Disney's next film, Mark was assigned to work with THE Eric Larson on the protagonist of Cinderella, who you might know as Cinderella. However, the two did not see eye to eye about the character in many ways. Eric, who came onto the film first and did more footage, wanted a sweet 16-year-old girl with a pug nose, while Mark wanted what Eric called a more exotic female. Ultimately, the two meshed very well together, and the two visions bring out an interesting, dynamic character. Cinderella is sweet, homely, and compassionate, but also very intelligent, and knows that the way she's being treated by her stepfamily is not right. This is sort of a doodle sheet that Mark Davis um, did during the making of Cinderella, and you can see this is probably early on where he's analyzing her face. They're more difficult because the audience knows them better. We look at one another all the time. And uh, so these, we're very critical when we look at one another. So when you put a human character on the screen, all of those things are right in play. If it's a little animal and people aren't that familiar, they still will be accepted but the human character, no. This was the first time Mark was assigned to work on a human figure using rotoscope. They'd shoot live action and they'd blow it up to animation-sized paper, and then they'd put a sheet of animation paper and draw right over it. If the live action was good, well, I used it, and if it wasn't, I didn't use it, and then I'd, and I'd use the best parts of it, and I'd, I'd, I'd use it to help me enhance something, you know? But uh, I still didn't like to use it. It was very restricting. I guess you could call it a whole new world. Too bad he didn't work on that film, though, because that joke would have killed. Right? Anyway, despite its restrictions, he did a wonderful job. For example, the scene where she is mopping and then receives the invitation from the prince. Her gestures and posture show her feelings and character very effectively. He also animated her in the heartbreaking scene where her stepsisters tear apart her dress and the bibbidi-bobbidi-boo sequence. In this last scene, he ended up animating Walt Disney's favorite piece of animation, which in my opinion is worth more than any Oscar. Walt Disney had some guests at lunch one day and somebody told me this story that, anyway, that uh, one of them asked, so Mr. Disney, of all the animation that's been done uh, in your studio, what is your favorite piece of animation? And he thought for a moment, he said, well, he said, I guess it would have to be when Cinderella got her, her her ballroom gown, her dress. And uh, now that doesn't mean that's the best piece of animation, but this is also a part of this magic that was Walt Disney, this belief that good things were going to happen, good things were there, and that's what this was. Oh, just leave it to me. What a gown this will be. I must say, I've always felt very good about it. I don't think it's the best piece of animation ever done, but it was something that hit the heart and it struck Walt. Much to his dismay, Davis ended up animating realistic women many times that decade. <gasps> Moving a girl with rotoscope is a pretty rotten way to make a living, he once said. One of the things Milt Call and I suffered from is that we could both draw so much better than some of the others. We both had a better understanding of the human figure, and there simply weren't that many guys who could handle them. Mark did several scenes with Alice in Alice in Wonderland, including the Mad Tea Party sequence. Alice was a difficult character to do for the simple reason that here's a perfectly normal little girl thrown into what amounts to being a madhouse. I worked on the sequence, uh, the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, and uh, Kimball, Ward Kimball did the, uh, the, the Mad Hatter with March Hare, and the, the dorm also. Uh, he got to do the fun stuff, <laughs> and uh, we had, uh, had to do, you know, 
you do these things and uh, it's the supporting character really yet if if those characters are not done well then the whole film falls apart <laughs> Why is a raven like a writing desk? Riddles? Let me see now. Why is a raven like a writing desk? I beg your pardon. Why is a raven like a writing desk? Why is a what? Ever. She's stark, raven, mad. But, but it's your silly riddle. You just said... That it's okay. Oh, about a nice cup of tea. Have a cup of tea, indeed. Well, I'm sorry, but I just haven't the time. Next, he moved on to Peter Pan, where he received a more interesting, challenging assignment to animate the majority of Tinkerbell. Still a realistic girl, but like smaller and with wings. Listen, we're just trying to make it sound better for you, Mark. She couldn't speak, but Davis did a great job at using body posture, walks, and expressions to make her a big presence in the feature. The character that I worked on was Tinkerbell, and Tinkerbell was visualized as a spot of light, which no doubt was something like a strong flashlight that moved around on the, on the background of the, of the stage. In our medium, you couldn't just use a spot of light. So I came up with the design that uh, you see uh, here. She's a pure pantomime character, which in itself I think is very interesting. That she didn't talk, but you know what she's thinking. Here's the one of the things was she landed on the mirror and she was noticing that she was putting on too much weight. She kind of measured off the size of her hips. And uh, you wanted to, uh, you know, the conclusion was that we wanted to be cute and to be sexy. Uh, again, she becomes uh, a pure pantomime character. And, uh, you know, she could jingle and she could sparkle, and, uh, but she showed all the physical attitudes of an angry girl. Oh, Peter, you saved my life. Captain Hawk admits defeat. Tomorrow, I leave the island, never to return. I'm glad to hear that, Captain. I'll tell the crew and... And that's why I asked you over, me dear, to tell Peter I bear him no ill will. Oh, Pan has his faults to be sure. Uh, bringing that Wendy to the island, for instance. Dangerous business, that. Why, rumor has it that already she has come between you and Peter. Mark also animated Mary Darling, another example of a restrictive female character. George, dear, do hurry. We mustn't be late for the party, you know. So, back to square one for you, Mark. After Peter Pan, he skipped Lady and the Tramp. Mark, Mark, this is what you wanted. These are dogs. <sighs> and so he moved to the long and exhausting production of, oh my gosh, really? <sighs> Sleeping Beauty. Here he animated two characters, the charming Aurora and the evil Maleficent. Sleeping Beauty is a milestone of a certain type of feature that we never did again, Davis once explained when giving a lecture. We did a lot more design with the characters than we had ever done before or would ever do again. Sleeping Beauty herself was more designed in two-dimensional shapes than any other character we had done. We uh, had decided to do uh, Sleeping Beauty as a, uh, as what Walt called a, a moving illustration. So we did a style in there that was different from any other Disney film. We stylized the, the drawing of, of uh, Briar Rose. We stylized the drawing of Maleficent. To help the stylized Briar Rose move realistically, Mark studied the movements of dancer Helene Stanley. Well, we used live action to kind of set a pattern that would, a character would have through the film. Uh, what you do is kind of do your first uh, rough scene of animation through a human being whom you would photograph. Then you look at this. Then you begin to uh, develop your own character. But what happens on the screen is very different. You see no resemblance really to uh, a live action character here. You see. Uh, a design and a pattern of, uh, of a 
pretty girl with uh, expressing emotion. The film, whose style would be spearheaded by fine artist Ivan Earl, would create great challenges for animators. However, where other animators struggled to adapt, Davis embraced the style of Earl. In an already highly stylized picture, Davis, along with character designer Tom Oreb, crafted a leading lady of elegance. Aurora and her alias, Briar Rose, was more refined than previous heroines, both in character and design. She was dignified, her shape angular, and precise in fusion with Earl's vertically and horizontally inclined backgrounds. Her golden hair was touched with Art Novo or Art Deco style curls, an impressionistic flair but highly realized. Aurora was self-confident, more of repose than the usual naivete of Disney heroines. So all around she was just one classy gal. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder why each little bird has a someone to sing to, sweet things to, a gay little love After Sleeping Beauty, Mark moved on to 101 Dalmatians, where he animated Cruella de Vil, which you can learn more about right here. Later, Mark, with a few other animators, produced preliminary work on an animated film that they hoped to eventually make at the studio. The film Chanticleer was never made because management deemed a chicken movie to be not so interesting. Hmm, I guess Chicken Run and Chicken Little would later disagree. Some of the work did go on to influence Robin Hood in 1973. After Chanticleer was bagged, having not been assigned to any specific animation effort, Mark Davis would unknowingly begin his W.E.D. or WED legacy. In 1962, Walt Disney asked Mark to head over to Disneyland and take a good, hard, critical look at Mind Train Through Nature's Wonderland, which opened in 1960. See what you think about this thing. Walt was less than satisfied with this somewhat boring attraction. Upon viewing the attraction, Mark quickly saw that there was an awful lot of things wrong with Mine Train and other attractions. He had plenty of constructive feedback for Walt and many ideas for improvement. They had no gags in it, no story at all, Mark said about Mine Train through Nature's Wonderland. One Kit Fox's head is going up and down. Then about 100 feet away, another Kit Fox's head is going left and right. So I took the two, put them nose to nose, so one's going up and down and the other moves side to side. So immediately you have some humor. You know, that classic joke about foxes moving differently. <laughs> oh, what a knee slapper. Look, the 60s were a different time, all right? Give the guy a break. From there, Mark moved his expertise to Jungle Cruise. When I started working down there, there was nothing that was uh, funny in any of the attractions that I can recollect. And, uh, and this was the thing all the way through trying, that I have tried to do is to bring in humor. I did the redo of the uh, Jungle River ride, and I added the elephant pool and uh, the trap safari and that sort of thing to that. And uh, I think that trap safari was probably the first laugh that uh, Disneyland had an attraction. This was really kind of the first big kind of job of love. So anyway, I did the elephant pool, and these are little explorations of things, again, something that an elephant, uh, our elephants could do that you wouldn't see with a real elephant. And matter of fact, I remember somebody went through there one day and a couple of elderly ladies said, well, you can, t you can tell me those big elephants aren't real, but those little elephants are real. But we had them doing things, you know, like two sprays out of the trunk and so forth. The Enchanted Tiki Room was Mark's first project that he was able to work on from the beginning. So the thing was that, uh, <coughs> We begin to, or at least I begin to form a kind of my own philosophy of what an audio animatronic show was in a park such as Disneyland or Disney World, or the same would be in Tokyo. One thing, nobody wants to stay in one attraction very long. And uh, not staying in one attraction very long, you want to give uh, a lot of show in a very short space of time. but. What we really found, what I found here, was this show is built of a series of surprises. You do not know what's going to happen. You go in there and there's some birds and 
I would say you can certainly assume that the birds are going to uh, come to life. It's pretty obvious that they would. And uh, they go through their little bit, and, uh, and then things begin to happen. The, the fountain comes to life, and, uh, uh, and it moves to music. The lighting is so important in this. And uh, I may not have the things in, in exact order, but when these uh, uh, big bowls that hold the flowers come down and the flowers begin to sing, and then the, the kind of key flowers come up and, uh, and sing solo. Again, this is, it's a surprise. It's what you did not expect to see. And, uh, and then finally the ceiling opens up and this bird mobile comes down. And, uh, and then finally, the whole room comes to life. Now this is, to me, uh, this is the most exciting part of the show is when this, I guess it's the Hawaiian war dance comes on and, and black the room on and light, you know, and lightning flashes. And then even the wall decorations come to life. The, uh, the poles that uh, are holding up the building come to life. And I think this is uh, really the extraordinary thing. Now this was, this was the first sketch I think I did when we were only gonna have maybe two heads on these. Then we finally ended up with uh, three heads. And this was, this was a, a more or less a finished sketch that I did. And these are based on, they're based on New Guinea art. Uh, the only thing is that I have taken a lot of liberties with it. Disneyland and the 1964's World's Fair go together like bread and butter, Oreos and milk, orange juice and toothpaste. Maybe not that last one. Many future Disneyland attractions would come out of it, all of which Mark Davis worked on. You can learn more about it in this wonderful Defunct Land episode. It's a very interesting piece of Disney history. The attractions include Ford Magic Skyway, Carousel of Progress, It's a Small World, and Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. This was limited in that, uh, uh, to the degree that you had uh, characters with their feet nailed to the floor, practically. So you had to do, you had to figure out something for them to do that was believable. Walt was a, a great admirer of Abraham Lincoln. This is, I believe I remember him saying that even as a youngster, he had portrayed Abraham Lincoln in, at, at his school on a Lincoln birthday or something of the sort. So uh, Walt asked me to give it some thought, and I did uh, a number of things of how, how simple things work in anatomy, how perhaps a mechanical hand could work. This was rather naive in thinking because really our problem was not to create a mechanical man, but it was rather to create an illusion. Mr. Lincoln would have to rise from a seated position, move one leg forward, and then put himself up into a standing position. We had great technical difficulties in getting the character to move properly in New York, and God would be going great, and then all of a sudden he would do a great jerk or decide to sit down. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it was a very difficult period of time, and we were about two weeks late getting Mr. Lincoln to operate. Walt was very nervous. Uh, we all were very nervous. Today finally came for Mr. Lincoln's first performance. By golly, Mr. Lincoln went all the way through. Matter of fact, uh, we were so successful with this in, in illusion that uh, the reviewer, I think, for the New York Times saw it and explained how Mr. Lincoln stood up and walked forward on the stage and gave his address. So the illusion was pretty good. What constitutes the bulwark of our liberty and independence? It is not our frowning battlements, our bristling sea coasts. These are not our reliance against tyranny. Mark followed this up with two classic Disney rides, the first of which was Pirates of the Caribbean, or Pirates of the Caribbean, however you want to be about it. Whatever. Walt said he wanted to do a pirate ride. We did a model 
of the attraction. And Walt saw all of that. And then we started building figures. But uh, Walt was afraid, well, we're going to see this pretty close. Well, when you're moving you, uh, in, like in a boat, you don't see things that way. You're moving along. You see something here. You see something there. You're always looking forward. So the um, highly uh, developed auctioneer figure that we put in there really was quite unnecessary. And I said, said this to him, and he said, hey, look, Mark, he said, that's great. He said, you know, he said, we get so much repeat business here. He said, that means each time we come down, we'll see something that we didn't see before. Strike your colors, you blooming cockroaches! Cars of thunder, we'll see you to Davy Jones! One thing that bothered me with the part right here is the fact that the ride was over at the bottom of that up ramp and is over at the bottom of that up ramp. Then you have to go ratchety, ratchety, ratchety all the way to the top. Then you get a <laughs> bunch of bolts banged around there. Uh, then you wait and you wonder, uh, well, what are we going to do next or when the hell are we going to get off of here or what? <laughs> and it takes that, to me, that great amusement of the attraction away from it. And so when we did the Florida one, I wanted to use a, a speed ramp to get people up and unload them at the bottom. So what I did was to do that scene, which turned out pretty much like this, a big treasury, an awful lot to see. And uh, anyway, to do a, a parrot that could sing the song in its entirety here, so you could hear all the lyrics, and enough stuff to look at on the outside and just nutty, nutty things here. <laughs> and uh, even to these figures, uh, which are inside. And the reason they're the color that they are, I want everything inside of that room there to be golden. I want that to look uh, rich, everything gold. So I didn't use any cool colors on them. I used the khakis and the yellows and the golds and uh, yellow rope and what have you. And. Uh, I think there's an effectiveness in that of, as I say again, it's making a complete visual statement. Something we can do uh, perhaps better than anybody else. This was followed by the Haunted Mansion. Mark, I want you to meet uh, Julie Reen. Mark Davis. Very nice to meet Julie you. is uh, Miss Disneyland Tencennial. And Mark Davis is the uh, master in charge of our House of Illusions, or. Uh, uh, what do we call it? Uh, a haunted mansion. Haunted mansion and uh, <laughs> and uh, supernatural. Oh, lots Can you of give her a little idea what the, we're going to have in there. <laughs> yes, well, we're doing a lot of portraits that change right in front of your very eyes. As a matter of fact, one of our paintings here is based on Greek mythology. This is Medusa. is a very beautiful girl. She offended the goddess Athena, and as a result, Athena turned her into a gorgon. And as you may know, if you looked at a gorgon, a gorgon would turn you into stone. Well, we sure don't want that to happen. What well, does uh, tell her about this thing here, will you mind? Well, this is our uh, <laughs> elongating stretching room. And in this room, we also have some stretching portraits. Perhaps you'd like to look at those over there. These are some of You pull them down. You should see what happens when the room gets longer. You get this full-size portrait. <laughs> this is my favorite here. Oh. <laughs> Mark also worked on the greatest show featuring singing bears, the Country Bear Jamboree. Unfortunately, during the production, Walt Disney passed away. About two weeks before Walt died, he came into my office and sat down. He just wanted to talk. Matter of fact, in that chair in there, as a matter of fact. And, uh... He saw these drawings on the wall, and uh, he laughed like hell. He looked very bad. Anyway, we went out and had a meeting on a little thing that we were doing, came back in, and then he walked down the hall and said goodbye. And I never saw him after that. He never said goodbye to anybody in his life. Said, well, I'll see you next week or something. But anyway, probably the last laugh he had was these bear drawings. Mark always remembered the best piece of advice his boss ever gave him. I remember one time uh, I, I had a talk with Walt, and this was up in his office, and uh, I said, uh, 
you know, there's two ways you could do this, uh, uh, an expensive way and an inexpensive way. And he says, no. He said, Mark, I don't, I don't agree with that. He said, he says, I think when you do something and you do it well enough, the public's going to pay you back for it. And I think when other people understand that, I think you can do anything. Mark also worked on America Sings and an unbuilt attraction, Western River Expedition, before he retired in 1978. Mark Davis passed away in 2000 in Glendale, California. And that about covers it. Mark Davis was truly a Disney legend. His talent with the human form can be seen in his design and animation of many princesses and the leading ladies throughout his career. His creativity didn't end there, though. He also had a lasting effect on Disneyland and the theme park industry in general when he broke the mold and designed a story to go along with the ride, which is a great way to inspire and remind us... There's a great big beautiful tomorrow Shining at the end of every day There's a great big beautiful tomorrow Just don't dream away Thank you to these people for your generous support. And a special thank you to John David. You guys are really helping keep this channel afloat. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of Dizographies. Don't forget to check out our Patreon and Discord, and click the thumbs up button below if you liked the video. And if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, subscribe and click the bell. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked below. We hope to see you in another Dizography.